68-66, Canelo. He's only two rounds off. Saunders took an awkward step back, and now he's holding on. Welcome back to When Boxers Enter the Matrix here on SMB Boxing. In this series, we will take a look at some of the best defensive displays and sequences from the history of the sweet science. I'm young, I'm handsome, I'm fast, I'm pretty, and can't possibly be beat. If you enjoy our videos, please leave us a thumbs up, and if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing for more great boxing content. These are 20 times that boxers entered the matrix Part 2. Nassim Hamid's absence from Part 1 was heavily questioned in the comments, so we're going to start Part 2 with a vintage display from The Prince. Oh, terrific right hand, and then a delayed action fall for Angeles. It seemed to take a while to take effect. It was the right hand, I'm sure, that did it. In 1995, 19-0 Hamid moved up to featherweight for his first world title challenge against WBO champion Steve Robinson in the champion's hometown of Cardiff, Wales. Nassim Hamid, will the Prince's big hitting take Robinson out? From the outset, Hamid used superb footwork and reflexes to land power shots and make Robinson miss. This will Robinson not doing a great deal at the moment, he's just keeping very tight. Yes, he's just flicking the gloves. What he's trying to do is get Robinson to lead to counter. He's really taking chances in there to try and get Robinson out of that crab-like defense. I know this big Welsh crowd would love to have those smiles wiped off his face. He seemed to catch Robinson with one then. He just seemed to stagger a bit when that one landed. Not just satisfied with winning the early rounds, Hammond greeted almost every offensive attempt from the Welsh champion with a grin or a showmanship taunt. It's dispiriting at the moment for Robinson because all he's doing is hitting the night air. He must have thrown about 30 punches in this round and none of them have landed. Hamid's the boss at the moment, but it's early. Slippery, quicksilver, elusive young man from Sheffield. With the problem Robinson has, when he comes out of that crouch, he's getting caught with punches. He thought he maybe made to look stupid in a few rounds. Doing his own version of the Ali shuffle. Hamid. Robinson just can't close the range on him. Yes, that's a problem. Robinson needs to get to Hamid to wear him down. In this moment, Hamid isn't allowing him to get in range. You see good defensive work there from Hamid. By the fifth round, Hamid was in complete control, and when he sent a demoralized Robinson to the canvas for a scored knockdown, the fight was only going to end one way. Down goes Robinson for only the second time in his career. in the way of boxing ability. He's driving the punches home, he's finding the angles now, and he's beginning to get through. Well, he's probably lost every round bar the first. And Hamed here is going for the finish, I think. Robinson still trying to nail him, and still hitting thin air. In the last couple of rounds, maybe. I think the referee stopped it. He stopped the fight, and Prince Nassim Hamed is now king. The coronation of the young star. Prince Nassim Hamed wins his first world championship. In 2009, many boxing observers felt that Andre Durrell should have took home Carl Froch's WBC belt when they met in the opening night of Showtime's Super 6 tournament. Touch glove. Good luck. The fight was far from a classic. In rounds one through nine, Froch was the aggressor and threw more punches, but very few of them landed cleanly. Durrell was content to being constantly on the move and picked Froch off with some fast and accurate counter punches while also being guilty of clinching too much. Because he hasn't been able to put Durrell against the ropes. Durrell doing a lot of holding. The fight looked to be continuing in the same pattern in the 10th round. However, after the referee deducted a point from Durrell for his excessive clinching, Durrell held his ground more and made Froch miss and pay with counter shots that had real force behind them. 
and this skillful sequence in the 11th round proves it. Strategy for him. There he switches again, though, and Trotz can't take advantage while he's doing it. Oh, look at the head movement. Wow! And he comes up with a left hand. Incredible speed and quickness. That was a telling sequence in this fight. Mark Two Sharp Johnson is one of the best fighters from the smaller weight classes that some boxing fans have never even heard of. Orozco backing up Johnson, hitting him at will, teeing off on him. Orozco is in big trouble, and Carlos Padilla stops him. What an impressive 12th round knockout for Mark Two Sharp Johnson. He came out and nailed Orozco with everything in the book. Johnson won world titles at flyweight and super flyweight twice and was a staple of the ring magazine pound for pound list during the prime of his career. However, for one reason or another, Johnson never got to fight the marquee names in and around his weight classes. And this is largely the reason why his career went under the radar. Johnson up, dancing, moving. Little Ali shuffle. Beautiful boxing just made Montiel miss him. Although the seventh defense of his IBF flyweight title against Luis Rolland in 1998 is not considered to be one of his sharpest performances, Johnson still won by double figures on all of the scorecards. And there he landed a right hand to the head. And that is a heavy, oh. there is a heavy right hand by Mark Johnson. And you can tell Rolland is a little bit stunned. And the body shots are setting everything up to the head, Dan. Johnson outfought Rolland for the first eight rounds before following his corner's instructions and taking the Puerto Rican challenger to the playground. See the protector of uh, Mark Johnson being as high as it is outside of his trunks. My favorite body punch story was, was Mickey Duff, who had a fighter fighting Matthew Franklin. And there you see uh, Pernell Whitaker showboating. This is just a protection there. I was afraid the guy would raise his punches and really hurt him. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's Mark Johnson now really uh, taunting Luis Rolón, one of Mark Johnson's handlers, said to him during that break between rounds eight and nine, we're on TV, Mark, let's go to the playground. So I'm not sure we're going to see an end to the uh, pseudo showboating by uh, by Mark Johnson, the champion. Yeah, you know, but yet it's, made a mystery it's been an there. admirable performance by Rolón. He's tried. Some serious showboating and hot dogging taking place here yeah. by Mark Johnson, the champion. I guess in a sport when, when Hector Camacho made a name for himself and Jorge Paez and, and a lot of people. And still the IBF Lightway champion of the world, Mark Tushar Johnson. It seems like every time the current pound-for-pound -pound star Saul Canelo Alvarez steps into the ring, his ever-improving defense gains the most attention online. 68-66 Canelo, he's only two rounds old. Saunders took an awkward step back and now he's holding on. En route to a decision victory over Danny Jacobs, which made him the unified world middleweight champion in 2019, Canelo eluded the American's punches with stellar head and upper body movement through several sequences. He's only 28, but has the second most fights in the pound for pound top 50. Has that got the crowd's attention? That was a whistling right hand from Jacobs that just missed. Alvarez trying to work his way into Jacobs. Both guys showing a very hard jab from Alvarez. Jacobs tried to set up the right hand, but hard jabs from both these fighters. Here he is, still topping that. Said it's almost like his life is a movie, and he's just sitting back eating popcorn watching it. Alvarez doubling up the left hook. Jacobs caught him with a left hand up top. Nice stroke there from Daniel Jacobs. He is the bigger man in the ring. Yeah, it's interesting to me, too, because he's kind of pity pat his, his jab. Now the unified middleweight champion of the world, Saul Canelo. In 1986, Mike Tyson's 19th fight KO streak, which began on his pro debut, 
ended with a close-fought 10-rounder against James Tillis went to the judges' scorecards. The bell is going to sound. Ultimately, the decision showed the fourth round to be the difference between a Tyson victory and a draw, as two of the three judges scored the fight 6-4 to Tyson. During the deciding fourth session, Tyson memorably ducked as low as Tillis's knees to avoid his punches and scored a knockdown with a counter left hook. It's missed slightly for Tyson. Look how low he gets to duck under those punches. Extraordinary. Tillis could have butted him with his knee there. He was distracted before he got punched. Again, he lunges in. It gets close. The left hand. Drops Tillis onto the seat of his pants as round four is coming to a close. Whenever the mood took him, Emmanuel Augustus would literally dance around his opponents in a style that earned him the fitting nickname, the Drunken Master. Emmanuel the Augustus is loving it though. They're, they're clapping, they're and loving it. Hujo is still being patient, still sticking with the game plan. Not letting it go on. <laughs> Excuse me, folks, I can't help you. He's got to tell him it's not open mic night. The highly entertaining Augustus fought from 1994 to 2011 and finished with a career record of 38 wins, 34 losses, and 6 draws. However, despite sounding unimpressive, Augustus's record is very deceiving due to his willingness to take on all comers at short notice, and he was on the wrong end of many close and bad decisions, including an infamous hometown verdict against Courtney Burton in 2004, which ended with Teddy Atlas having an on-air argument with an official at ringside. How come you don't have an even score? That's not a majority you're, you're decision. You're telling me it's a majority decision. Do you know the rules of boxing? This official here in Michigan is telling me, and he's admitting that he's wrong. Can we fix this now? Because the wrong guy got the decision. Can we fix this? One fight before being robbed against Burton, Augustus recorded one of his best wins of his career when he upset rising super lightweight contender Alex Trujillo. Shake hands, good luck to you. Augustus looked in control as early as the third round, and he reacted to a right hand from Trujillo by doing some of his signature drunken master moves. Well, forward, you should box, you should counter, and he's a little frustrated right now. And Augustus, his showboat, sometimes it'll hurt him a little bit, though, to take him out of the fight a little bit and allow the opponent to start getting off. Lights out Tony has been in this situation, he would say the same thing, throw to the chest, not to the head. But don't allow Augustus to get into your head the way he's getting into the head right now. It's real. It's real doing nothing, just going defensive. As the fight progressed, Augustus's unorthodox style made Trujillo gun shy. At one point in the ninth round, Augustus went over half a minute with both his hands behind his back, and Trujillo still couldn't hit him with anything of note. Back to live action where you are watching Emmanuel Augustus fight Alex Trujillo literally with his hands behind his back. Well, he's taken, obviously, this is not the first time we've seen it. The winner by unanimous decision and new IBA Junior Underweight Champion, Emmanuel Augustus. We said in part one that no video about boxing defense would be complete without some Pernell Whitaker, and we're sticking by it for part two. They were slapping, but there were a lot of those punches. Well, that's, that's a different Pernell Whitaker to stand in front and let somebody tee off on you. A little bit of character by Hurtado in the face of adversity. After a controversial first career defeat to Jose Luis Ramirez in 1988, Whitaker dished out a boxing lesson to the Mexican in their 1989 rematch for the WBC and IBF lightweight titles. Shake hands, good luck. Unlike the movement he utilized to stay out of trouble in their first meeting, Whitaker stood in the pocket, moving his head and bending at the waist to avoid incoming punches. Furthermore, Sweet Pea consistently landed his right jab, and when the time was right, unleashed fast combinations that pushed Ramirez back. He has one of the outstanding jabs in boxing. Again, look at Whitaker's ability to throw combinations. 
and the combinations of Pernell Whitaker are just getting through easily. His performance against Jose Luis Ramirez was that of Julio Cesar Chavez. Uh, Whitaker is much more dominant than Chavez was against Ramirez. We'd like to alert our ABC stations that at the conclusion. I'd like to see that my way. The other fight that... Uh, and Pernell Whitaker <laughs> hot dogging a little bit. A lot of upper body movement by Whitaker rather than leg movement to avoid the blows. He's playing some of his earlier styles, but oh, good counter combination by Whitaker. With a fight all but one, Whitaker put on a show for the crowd in the 12th and final round. I think he's done that as he has to ooze. There. Caught Whitaker with a few punches again. Whitaker in the corner. And it's good. Attempting to put Whitaker back into the corner with a forearm, but Pernell Whitaker gets out much to the delight of the crowd. Another day at the office for the extremely talented Pernell Whitaker. We're sure that many viewers watching today will know that Whitaker was tragically killed in a 2019 road accident. Thirteen days after the Hall of Famer passed, Tevin Farmer wore a tribute to Whitaker on his trunks and delivered a fitting Sweet Pea-esque performance against Guillaume Fuenois, who landed just 75 punches over 12 rounds. Touch gloves. Let's go to work. One and one, obviously vastly experienced. If there's one, it really brings clarity to the sport and the division. Right? Well, he was ranked third, and yet no one was ranked number two or number one. He fights on the inside, on the outside, body shots. Someone can turn their career around and become an enormous success doing everything holistically and seriously. Overachieving fighter. It's just difficult to see. That's why I think this is just heartening to see these two get together. Right, and now they create a lot of buzz. Frenois now trying to load up with that left hand. At least he has tried. Traps Farmer in the corner. Farmer is moving his head. Look at this. With Sweet Pea on his trunks. Defensive excellence. Beautiful to watch. Body shots ripping from Farmer and a right hand and again gorgeous combinations by the champion. It's just beautiful to watch. I love defense. Great left hand there. I love defense because it's so difficult to do. You know what I enjoy here Sergio in this round is that champ comes out. He's winning all these rounds. Some clean shots. His best offensive round. Final minute. See the movement by the ropes. Farmer slipping and sliding the night away. You're wearing Pernell Whitaker's name yeah. on your trunks. What did Pernell Whitaker mean to you? Oh, man, he was a great, he was a legend um, of the sport. And um, God bless his soul. Julio Cesar Chavez combined aggressive pressure with sublime head movement to break down his opponents. You're heavy handed, and what a finish. Accurate. He does it all. From 1980 to 2005, Chavez competed in four different weight divisions, winning six world titles, and notably began his career with an 87 fight winning streak. With 87 wins, no losses, an impressive 75 wins coming by way of knockout. During his second reign as the WBC light welterweight champion, Chavez, in a moment of bravado, showed Giovanni Parisi that his head movement was equally as good in a defensive posture. Parisi missing wildly with the combination, and Chavez again invites him in. And look at this head movement by Chavez. Chavez just playing, just playing. Hat him out. He's been on the offensive. He says, now let me show you what a great defensive fighter is. Come on, let me show you. Throw all you got, and you can't hit me. Yeah, you can't hit me. No, no. See? No, no. He just... Look at that. Miss, miss, miss. And he didn't even throw anything back, although he could have. It was just like a little bit of fun. Through most of the 2010s, Guillermo Rigondeaux was one of the most avoided fighters in boxing. Yeah, yeah. And the left eye of Ramos is, oh, he's got a problem. And now here comes Rigondeaux. And there goes Rico Ramos from a left to the body. And that one was very legal. It is over. 
Honed during a prestigious 400-fight amateur career in which he won two Olympic gold medals for Cuba, Rigandau's style of boxing can be best described as a defense-first approach with the emphasis on powerful counterpunching, smooth footwork, and quick reflexes. Without a doubt, Rigandau's finest night as a professional came in a super bantamweight unification fight against Nonito Donaire in 2013. The Cuban put on a clinic from the very start. He bounced on his toes, fired pulverizing overhand lefts, and either slipped or countered wild shots from Donaire. That significant questions, and both have promised that they want to be aggressive. And already there's an exchange. And Donaire was rocked back by a left hand off of the stance of Rigandau. There's another left hand over the top by Rigandau. Because both guys have a point to prove here. Oh, good shot by Rigandau. Absolutely. Well, he's trying to make Donaire make mistakes now. A left hand. Donaire wasn't even close with the counter right. Hard left hand over the top by Rigandau. So far, Rigandau is outboxing Donaire. Get impatient here and run into a big shot. And the right hand of the body by Donaire. And again, Rigandau lands with the right hook inside. It's just that Rigandau is all that and everything his amateur record suggested oh. is true. Is that Rigandau's reflexes are so good and his hands are so fast. What about trying to get his jab going, Roy? Talking about Donaire as he takes a left hand right on the button from Guillermo Rigandau. Rigandau did suffer a knockdown in the 10th round, but he was never in any trouble. And he responded by being more aggressive for the remainder of the fight. And that's what you were talking about. Exactly. Another left hook. Second one misses. Rigandau holds out his hands as if to say, I'm fine. You're not bothering me at all. Good hook. Right down. hand by Rigandau. Excellent hook. He needs it tonight. Oh. Great left hand shot by Rigandau. Good left hand by Rigandau. It's also one thing to run out to start the round and see if you can get something off quick. That several writers at ringside are tweeting that they don't know what we're watching. They see the fight as much closer than do we. And I think Rigandau just hurt Donnell because you see Donnell on his bicycle right now. Big left hook swing for Donaire, and he motions to Rigandau, says, come at me, come on, let's fight, and it's over. Guillermo Rigondeo! In his second comeback fight after more than two years out of the ring, Tyson Fury showed that his renowned defensive skills had not eroded when he backed into a corner and made Francisco Pianetta hit fresh air. Pianetta is uh, staying cool and calm, and as he did then, he's looking for the shot. He doesn't, he's not coming, he hasn't come in here, he's looking for the one punch. But I do like what I'm seeing from Tyson Fury now. This is, this is the Tyson Fury of old. You know, the fact he put his arms on the ropes, opened his hand, you know, a little like uh, uh, Cassius Clay, I remember him doing that back in the day. You know, putting his hands on the ropes and, uh, and, uh, and willing his opponent try to land a clean shot and he, and he couldn't do that. The moment instantly drew comparisons to Muhammad Ali's first round sequence against Michael Dokes, which was featured in part one. Well, Ali is asking for it. Dokes is trying to give it to him. Let us know in the comments whose was better, Fury's or Ali's. In 1986, Dwight Muhammad Kawi ruthlessly dispatched Leon Spinks to retain his WBA cruiserweight title. Kawi landing the right. Leon another one. Leon head jerking back. Kawi is just eating him up on the inside. Just took a devastating right to the uh, to his uh, to his left side from Kawi. Kawi is fighting really on hard here. After punishing Spinks for the best part of four rounds, Kawi was clearly enjoying himself and taunted Spinks while making him miss with some cocksure head movement. Again, the Spinks family behind us giving Leon excellent advice. Let it go. Let his hands go. at 
at Leon Fink. But so did Muhammad Ali. That, of course, was a different time and place. And, and a different Leon, Leon Fink, Fink. yeah. <laughs> Two rounds later, Brave Spinks was saved from further punishment when the referee, Mills Lane, called a halt to the contest. Oh, that's it. That's it. Brutal that's it. That's it. It's all over. Yes, sir. Mills Lane has stopped the fight. Yeah, absolutely. He's seen quite enough. And he steps over Leon and shakes his head and says, I'm not going to let you try to take any more of that. After a short 21-month retirement, Floyd Mayweather returned against Juan Manuel Marquez in 2009 and showed no signs of ring rust whatsoever. Listos, let's go, vamos. Simply put, the naturally bigger Mayweather dominated the fight with a superior hand and foot speed and ended up with a massive advantage in punch stats. According to CompuBox, Mayweather landed 290 of his 493 punches, which is a 59% connect rate. One of his best shots came in round two when he walked Marquez onto a left hook that put him down. And when Manuel Marquez is flawed in the second round. In stark contrast, Marquez landed 69 of his 583 punches, which is a 12% connect rate. Or to put it another way, Mayweather avoided 88% of the punches that Marquez threw his way. The slick left. You don't see Marquez miss like that, usually. You've just got to enjoy him, haven't you, Jim? For the ones that dig the shots in, spreads the feet, there's the right hand. Superb. six inches in front of this guy and you can't land cleanly on him just a jab to the body of marquez stopped him in a right hand worthwhile attacks now oh right hand that was a big shot from mayweather blood from the nose of marquez left hook right hand and marquez says come on then there's some bravery a mexican heart He'll keep trying to throw punches, that's what he's about. He's here representing Mexico. Mayweather is just dominating him at the moment. Just kind of treating him with disdain. Unanimous and wide, and the smile says it all. Welcome back to boxing, Floyd Mayweather. We've missed you. Michael Nunn is another fighter on this list who was vastly underrated. Nunn, a slick and speedy southpaw who carried knockout power in both hands, won world titles in both the middleweight and super middleweight divisions. Colin Bay is by nature... Oh my! A left hand sends Colin Bay down! A shocking turn of events in the first round! Sambu Colin Bay is out on the mat! Nunn's 1989 Knockout of the Year win over Sambu Colin Bay deserves an honorable mention, and we've just given it that. However, the night he dethroned the IBF middleweight champion Frank Tate to win his first world title is one of the best displays of pure boxing we've ever seen, and it's our pick as the best performance of his career. Starts things up, says, come on. Tate told us it's the left hook. And flash and, and get them busted up because they jump at each other and the styles don't mesh. Very, very dangerous. And a good right hook by Nunn. And both know how to use the feet. There's a by Michael well, Nunn. Two different fighters. Well, in the end, oh, hey, oh, a right uppercut that missed by Tate. And a right hook by Nunn that didn't miss. Nunn coming back. Nunn with a right. There goes the mouthpiece. Tate lost his mouthpiece. Nunn is so quick, and he loses. in round six. Oh. Tells Mills Lane I'm all right. Comes right 
back to Tate Crowley. Crowley got him on the side of the head. Oh, a big left by Donovan McBell. Oh, what a devilish shot. A lot of folks afraid of that style of his. And you can see why here tonight. Patient by Tate, but no effect. To me, like a left hook to the body. We will head into a ninth round. By Michael Nunn. And the punch that he threw when he dropped them was a left hook to the solar plexus. And Mills Lane is carefully looking at Frank Tate. A blistering attack by Michael Nunn. The crowd going wild. In 2002, Roy Jones Jr. was the undisputed light heavyweight champion of the world and still doing things in the ring no other fighter would even attempt to do. <laughs> the referee doesn't know which way to move. <laughs> Roy is opening up angles. <laughs> Against Glenn Kelly, who was unbeaten and the IBF's number one contender, Jones, as he had done so often before, made defending his titles look like a piece of cake. Now Jones came close to showing us Manson saying an uppercut. He never knew where Jones was going to punch from. Jones is mixing up his attacks so much. In round seven of a completely one-sided fight, Jones, while backed up against the ropes audaciously, placed both of his hands behind his back, and when Kelly took the bait, he ended the fight in an instant. Fight sooner or later, for your talent will not carry you there because of the style of the opponent or whatever. Like, Same Mobley learned that on Saturday night. Yeah. Again, once again, third knockdown of the night. Who never saw it. <laughs> Good performance. Maybe Roy's most proud pleasing performance in the past few years. Yes, he did it. Muhammad Ali's first title reign is widely considered as the prime years of his career. Ali won the WBC, WBA, and lineal heavyweight titles against Sonny Liston on February 25, 1964, and made nine successful title defenses up to April 28, 1967. His reign was not ended because of a defeat. It was ended because he was stripped of his titles and suspended from boxing for refusing to be drafted to fight in the Vietnam War. It has been said that I have two alternatives, either go to jail or go to the army. But I would like to say that there is another alternative, and that alternative, that alternative is justice. When Ali returned to boxing three years later, he was still a great fighter and would win the heavyweight title twice more. But his speed, movement, and reflexes were all significantly slower and less influential in deciding fights. To finish part two, we're going to show you our picks of the top three best performances from Ali's first title reign. I'm young, I'm handsome, I'm fast, I'm pretty, and can't possibly be beat. You might be young and handsome, but you won't be after I finish with you. Starting with the night, Ali shook up the world and beat Sonny Liston. Coming into the fight, Ali, then known as Cassius Clay, was given little chance of upsetting the powerful champion and was a 7-1 to one underdog. However, Ali proved to be too quick and agile for Liston, who looked awkward and struggled to land clean blows, while Ali scored with persistent jabs and combinations. Has his own style and it's confusing for the champion to fathom this early in the fight. Another jarring right hand that time, folks. Another one, Sonny Wobble. Sonny Wobble has him hurt. Sonny is... Sonny is talking to... He has a cut below the eye. And he's getting hit with all the punches in the book. In his corner at the end of the fourth round, 
Ali complained of a burning sensation in his eyes, which was allegedly caused by ointment on Liston's gloves. That's Angelo Dundee that he was arguing with, Joe. Angelo now is telling him off a little bit while he gets him ready. Getting ready for something, number five. Something wrong with Clay now, uh, Something wrong with Clay, something, something wrong with Clay. I see that, Joe, his eyes, his eyes are bothering him. Despite being impaired, Ali managed to survive the fifth round, and by the sixth round, his eyes had cleared and he resumed control of the fight. At the end of the round, Liston, who was cut under his left eye and sporting a puffy face, claimed that he had injured his shoulder and the fight was waved off by the referee. They might be stopping it. That might be all, ladies and gentlemen. I shook up the wall! I shook up the wall! I shook up the wall! I shook up the wall. After the WBA stripped Ali of their belt for rematching Liston in May of 1965, Ali got the chance to win the title back against their new champion, Ernie Terrell, in a unification bout in February 1967. During an intense buildup, Ali promised to punish Terrell after he refused to call him by his new name and instead called him by his old name, Clay, which Ali now referred to as his slave name. Cassius Clay, yes. Why do you want to say Cassius Clay when Howard yes. Cosell and everybody is calling me Muhammad Ali? Now why you got to be the one of all people who's color to keep saying Cassius Clay? Why don't you call me my name, man? Well, what's your name? You told me your name was Cassius Clay a few I years ago. I never told you my name was Cassius Clay. My name is Muhammad Ali, and you will announce it right there in the center of that ring after the fight if you don't do it now. I'm going to punish you. Let me tell you something, man. You ain't got no back off of me. Enough. Don't call me no Uncle Tom. That's what you are, a Uncle Tom. Why are you going to call me Uncle Tom? You, gonna, you heard me. me no Just Uncle back Tom. off of me. On fight night, Ali was true to his promise and not only dished out a brutal amount of punishment to Terrell over 15 rounds, he also taunted him multiple times by yelling at him, What's my name? <laughs> just happened in the ring, it spoke for itself. While the fight is mostly remembered for bringing out Ali's mean side, the nimble movement and swift reflexes he displayed to stop Terrell from landing anything significant should be remembered just as much, if not more so. It's amazing. Terrell came at him and at him and the champ slipped that last one beautifully. That's the point Shabalo made early. Not fighting the way he trained in the ring. Yeah, right. But look at his guts. His left hand, left hand is a defensive uh, uh, thing rather than go in after, more quickly, more strongly. Well, you know, tell the truth, uh, you know what I think now? I think Clay is, is acting somewhat like on the, in the fly pass and fight. Remember, he knocked him down the sixth round. And... Desperately to measure Ali with a right, but as you saw, couldn't bring it home. Standing up. As you can see, an overwhelming, unanimous decision I the undisputed for the champion, champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. Ali's true boxing greatness was never better exemplified than the night in November 1966, when he took apart the aging but still dangerous Cleveland Williams inside three rounds. Speed, mobility, majestic footwork, tactical brilliance, blinding combinations, not to mention the Ali shuffle. This was not only Ali's best performance from his first title reign, it's also regarded as the best performance from his entire 61 fight career. Right 
stands his ground in mid-ring, but is taking punches. Williams with the left of the nose. Clay ducked and then backpedaled away. Clay shuffling, shoots a left off the shovel, is pushed into Williams' corner, and cuts Williams with the left hand of the ear. Clay ahead. Williams unable to follow through, takes the left thrown by the champion. Clay with another left. Clay can hit him almost at will with his left jab. Some clear throwing from Williams' nose, but it bothers him not one whit. Here's Williams throwing the right, but Clay ducked. Clay ducked over the ring. They top rope and got away from the first bomb. Here's Clay with a combination left, right, left, catching Williams. His hair up on end again as Clay pops him with a left to the nose. Another one, another one. A right to the other. Clay air. weaving clockwise, a hard left. Draw the right to the nose. Williams down to the right. He's up at two, but he'll take a mandatory eight down. He's got Williams hurt in mid ring. Clay with a left, a right, a left. Williams with his back to us is getting hit as well. A left, a right. Clay has him going down on his. Sitting down above us. He gets up immediately. Take another mandatory eight round. A left misses by Williams. Williams will survive the round. A right, a left fight. Clay a left and a right. Williams flat on his back. But the bill will ring, but they'll keep counting. Williams was flat on his back. Kessler called the end of round two. But to throw bombs. He's been down three times. Takes a right short by Clay. Clay hitting him almost at will. Williams with that age apparently slowing him up. And he's a target here. The left and a right by Clay. Backing away. Goes into a shuffle. A right, left, right by Clay. A left. Williams trying to protect himself, can't do it. Left to the face, a left to the right. Williams down. He may not get out. Goes after him. Clay has a target now. Four knockdowns already. He's hitting with a barrage of left and right. Left, right, left. Clay feels he's got him now. Cuts him on the back of the ear and almost knocked him down. But Williams now, stand up style, backing away. Clay hits him with a left to the face. Williams doesn't quite know what to do. He's been hurt. Badly takes a left and a right in his own corner, right, and the referee stops the fight. It's all over. Clay wins by a technical knockout in round number three. Within hours of his rematch defeat, the public, the press, and rivals ridiculed Duran, with some claiming that the bout was fixed. Television and radio adverts featuring Duran were also rapidly pulled off the air. Have you ever known a fight to, to be like the one that you've seen in that ring tonight? I'm angry.